Hello everyone, I'm Hans Doctor, founder of Gradle and the CEO of Gradle Inc. And this is the first episode of our new webinar series uh, focused on build engineering and developer productivity. As every industry vertical is transformed by software, uh, development productivity has become a key mission for many organizations. Uh, it's a key competitive advantage. And I'm very happy to have Stefan Faber from LinkedIn with me today as our first guest. He is the founder of Mokido and a true expert in the field. And he's leading the DevTools team at LinkedIn. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you very much for having me, Hans. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Let's talk about automation. Yeah, cool. So let's start with the question, what brought you to build engineering? Hmm. Like many years ago, I found that the best use of my time is when I actually help other engineers in my organization to be productive. So I started making tools for engineers. You might use Mokiro as one example. I joined Gradle very early. We were like, there was four of us developing Gradle like back in 2011. And I'm also extremely passionate about the automation. I think that this is key for developer productivity. If everything is automated and you can ship your change to production as fast as possible, that is key indicator for productivity. So, uh Talking about that, uh, how many engineers do you have to support at LinkedIn? We have about 3,000 engineers and they are supported by a group of 300 engineers within foundation team. So we built this core developer infrastructures for all the devs so that they can ship high quality products to production as fast as possible, as reliably and as consistently. And that was, that was always a thing that impressed me with LinkedIn, how early they are they significantly invested into that space, right? I know organizations with, you know, thousand engineers that their foundation team, I don't know, it's a handful of people, I don't know, right? And, and you can see the results, mm -hmm. right? And so, so maybe you, you share a couple of more metrics sure. regarding the scale at which you're building at, at LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm happy to. So today we have 100,000 Gradle builds per day which is like amazing scale and like we're still trying to figure out how to manage that really well. And um, our most complicated, the biggest application, which is LinkedIn.com, it ships to production several times a day. Wow. And across like all the co code bases that form LinkedIn.com, we have over 1000 commits per week, which is for us, it's a very big scale. And of course there are like some companies out there that are like even higher scale. Uh, still, the level of challenges we have is pretty amazing. Yeah, and that you were, that you ship multiple times a day. We right? ship multiple times a day. So our, yeah. like, web frontend LinkedIn.com site that you might know if you use it, it ships uh, three times per day to production. The web services behind it, the mid tier services, they also ship several times a day. Some of those services would be shipping like even every change to production. It depends which yes. layer of architecture we're looking at. Um, and is that in a team responsibility to make the decision or we want to do continuous deployment or we want to have a, a different release life cycle or is, is, uh, how, 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 how is the organization figuring this out? That, that's a great question. For LinkedIn.com, we, we discovered very early that we really want to ship to production like multiple times a day. It's key for us because it puts a pressure on like entire ecosystem of tools and the processes in the organization and achieving that model with releasing to production so frequently gives us competitive advantage where we can test business theories and ship features to production very, very early. Yeah. Uh, one key insight that we have discovered is that we want to separate the code push from feature push. So code push is when like new binaries out there serving production traffic but the feature is not yet visible to everybody, right? right? So it's, it's gated, it's, yeah. uh, uh, and it, we, can, we can gradually show and uh, expose the feature to the growing population of our users and that manages the risks. And that's like part of our automation, yeah. part of our developer infrastructure, a part of our commit to production pipeline. And I think what is, what is fascinating with that, right? Of course, everyone want to ship that often, right? And for starts up, small teams, that's, pretty easy, right? But uh, on the scale of LinkedIn, I hardly know any organization who's able to pull that off. There are a few, but not many in the world. So uh, 
uh, there's still, we still have this organization and we're trying to get from three months to one month, right? Or we're trying to get to and, um, bi-weekly, yeah. right? So, and, and what is even for me even more fascinating, right, that you are doing this not just since last year, right? Uh, uh, at, at what point, do, do, oh. do, at, in what, at what point were you able to say, okay, we can now ship multiple times a day? It wasn't, uh, that was not always the case at LinkedIn. It was no, a, a no. conscious decision to invest and to make it a reality, right? No, we, we do have more products than just LinkedIn.com. LinkedIn.com yeah. is something that everybody knows. Other products can be shipping to production even more frequently, like at the level of every change, or, yeah. or maybe less frequently, depending on the sort of a business. Now, like in the past, we used to have monolithic architecture where, where all our microservices were in one giant code repository. That was a long time ago. And we have found that this, it hurts our ability to ship code. Like having the need to invest in that monorepo to scale was becoming like really the levels of investments like needed were like super high. Mm -hmm. And we decided that this is not the architecture. This is not how we want software development at LinkedIn. We want independent development cycles to our teams, like autonomy within teams. We still want to have a system that manages that. We want to have a standardized developer workflow that is optimized for trunk-based development, for yeah. shipping to production quickly, for like doing code reviews for of every change. So that a system that helps with quality at, at our scale. Yeah. At the same time, you want the independent development cycles, yeah. independent deployments. Yeah. So and that's for me. I mean that that we don't have time for a deep dive on the whole mono repo versus multi repo uh, topic, right? But it's a it's it's so and it's interesting, right? For me, it's a question. What is the boundary of the version control system of the source repository, right? And and kind of monorepo would mean there's only one boundary, it's the whole organization, right? But I think there are there are other good boundaries, right? Uh, where where you create more independence uh, uh, when when you when you go with a multi-repo approach, but you have to do the investment to uh, to connect all the pieces, right? Yes. For me, a very important thing is how do you get downstream awareness? So how do you how do you make sure that when when one repository breaks another repository, right, that that you learn about that very fast, and it's not always the consumers of that repository that have to figure out, hey, why am I not working anymore? So so is there anything you you do in this area at LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you want to go down that path because the okay. multi repo and yeah. mono repo discussion is like we could have a separate webinar yeah. on top yeah. on, on on that topic. We found at LinkedIn that when we invested more in multi-code base environment, mm-hmm. today we have 10,000 code bases at LinkedIn. And some of them are really, yeah. some of them would be sort of test projects that don't matter, like, yeah. you know, like some little things. Some of them would be like software libraries, relatively small. Mm-hmm. But then on that spectrum, we also have like pretty big, large applications like our LinkedIn.com, for example. And all that is developed in our multi-code base environment at LinkedIn. And we found that we need to build a lot of tools to organize that environment. Mm-hmm. Like we mm-hmm. want to know what are the dependencies like of all our like products. Yes. Yes. And this, like having that dependency graph, we found it like very useful because we can do very interesting yes. things with that. For example, yes. if I'm pushing a change to my library, we can automatically in our CI pipeline, we can automatically run builds and tests for all of the products that depend on that software yeah. library. As part of a pull request build? Uh, yes. More or less? Yes, more or less. Yeah, that's when that's, uh, yeah. that's where you want to be. And I think, that, and that's part of I think, our mission to to provide this as a commodity solution to the yes. world, right? Yeah. So, but that's uh, that's that's great this insight. Is, that's actually what I'm missing a lot. Like, when you are a company and you're growing, maybe you start with a monorepo because that's the yep. easiest way uh, to start. At some point, you have different products, different technology stacks. It does not make sense for you to have like one giant code base. But then you split out and you have those separate teams, separate code bases. But there are no like tools out there to like manage that yes. landscape of all your projects, yes. like to understand yes. your dependencies, yes. to uh, help you resolve conflicts if you are reusing code in your organization. And we do want to reuse code in the yes. organization, right? Yes. So uh, I'd love to have a solution yes. for that. I so that's a, but that's a good yeah. But you did the investment, and I think for you it's it's 
yeah, it's a, it's a really good yes. system you, you have developed. And, and just sharing something from, from our experience at Gradle. Gradle is a Mona repo, right? We have it, it's, know, a million lines of code. And for us, it, the build scales easily, right? So, so we, that, that, that is all under control. But what we have, what we have seen, it, it, the, the disadvantage of that is it reduces the engagement of the community. If you just want to contribute to the C++ plugins of Gradle and you have to deal with this big mono repo with complex test automation, it's not as much fun. And, yeah. and, and that's why we now have tried with some of the, some of the new projects like the Kotlin DSL to say, wait, we do this in a separate repository. And it's by far the biggest community engagement we've ever seen, right? So, so there, there are many reasons why you want to think about the boundaries, right, of repositories. And yeah. I, I was surprised that uh, initially that this is the, that this is actually at least for an open source project uh, 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 a very important aspect. I can yeah. I can totally imagine that like I'm a contributor I want to contribute to this code and yet this is pretty big code base like yes. I need to import all that to, to IntelliJ yes. or to my yes. ID and there's just so much classes that I have to so much yes. source code where do I even start yes. I need to run the build but like what tests I run which sub module like oh yeah. the build is going to take one hour like how long yeah. so I, I absolutely yeah. I get and, and then the issue track right the whole ecosystem there's a whole yes. ecosystem around this boundary right so issue tracker and Hey, you wanted to you want to follow the progress just of that repository, right? So, um, another thing I found fascinating, uh, so is that the metric number of builds. I, I found it, it. It sounds like a very simple metric that doesn't uh, that uh, that you could easily game and whatnot. But so two things I've seen, right, is that the organizations with a very high number of builds are the ones that are able to ship fast and uh, are the ones that are much more productive. And, and the differences between organizations are orders of magnitude when it comes to number of builds, right? And, uh, uh, and that, that is for me, that's one fascinating thing that's such a simple metric. Uh, of course, people could game it, but, if, but, but in general, give some, give some strong su suggestion already about how productive is this organization, how many feedback cycles do they have? I, so, I like that. I yeah. think this is interesting. Like with continuous delivery mode, with trunk-based development, with those modern development practices that optimize for developer productivity, like the number of builds you run is associated with how you partition your changes, how you develop code, right? Instead of like cooking your change for days yes. or weeks, you want to yes. work in increments and you yes. push that incremental change, right? That changes should be compatible. Because the change is small, then the code review uh, turnaround is relatively fast. So in general, like you know, the, 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 yeah. the whole pipeline is smooth. The whole development cycles are like more. And it's like to me, it's like also part of like lean development. Yes. Iterate like small yeah. batches, right? And and I think so. At LinkedIn, if I were a developer at LinkedIn, right? And I say, hey, LinkedIn has infrastructure that gives me feedback whether I've broken down something downstream. Yeah, I want that feedback. Yeah. So so it's an indication that yeah. people trigger builds to get feedback. So when you, yeah. when you, as the developer productivity team or the dev tool team, have an infrastructure that provides a lot of valuable feedback, I ask for that a lot. When I have a build infrastructure that is not giving me similar feedback opportunities, I, I have less incentive to, to ask that's for that true. feedback, right? So, uh, but yeah, that, that's what we found. It's like the quality of signal from our CI builds, like from tests, from our builds, is like critical to have like healthy ecosystem yeah. for like shipping changes fast for being able to upgrade the versions at scale because most of the changes are compatible changes so we can automatically propagate version bumps in our like ecosystem and we know the dependency graph right so we yes. want we know yes. where what to upgrade yeah. right I'm curious not sure if you want to answer that but yeah uh, have you had let's say 2017 uh, one incident where a couple of days you couldn't release I'm not sure saying I I'm think sure that is a so that's it depends on the product yeah so uh, let's looking at like let's say linkedin.com like yeah. our most prominent product it could have happened I don't I don't know the exact details yeah. but yeah. it's pretty rare because yeah. for us since our goal is to release to production three times a day this means that if there's no release in the first half of a day and I'm talking about that most of developers would be in Pacific Standard Time. So we don't yes. have a team that is spread out, yeah. Yeah. that works on that code base, yes. spread out the entire world. So yes. we're talking about eight, like, yes. we're talking about three releases within eight hours. 
And let's say if for four, five hours, half of the day, we don't have a release to production, this is very strong signal that and there's going to be some people, a group of people working on fixing it. And it's relatively urgent. And if there's no release uh, during a day, that's like a major problem. Yes. Like this is like on calls are like busy, sweating, yes. like let's figure it out. Like this has to be resolved. It's like a, because then imagine like we, we, was, we haven't had a release in a day. So the no, number of right. changes that accumulate is so yes. big. So the chance yes. that we're going to break the next release is higher. Right. Yes, exactly. So you can end up in this vicious circle yes. where you end up just delaying the release and like, oh no, we have to roll back because there's this yes. problem. So yeah, cool. I'd say that it's very rare yeah. that we have several days no, yeah. not released. It could have happened. Yeah. It's, it's a big issue even like for half a day if there's no release. Yeah. It's one of my favorite anecdotes. There was a, there was a situation a couple of, of years ago where, I don't know what bank, it was a public incident. Anyhow, their website, including online banking, was down for three days, right? Three days. I mean, it's unimaginable. Yeah, that's, but that's then, amazing. but the fascinating thing is, I was doing, con we were doing Scradle consulting for another bank, and I, I talked with one of their engineering leads, right, whether they heard about it. I said, yes. And the instructions they got from their management was basically because they were so afraid that could happen to them to not to release for the next six months, basically, to do a complete release freeze to kind of understand what happened and how well, can we avoid that. It solves the problem, right? It's, it's not going to be an aggression <laughs> if you don't shoot any changes, yes. right? Exactly. But I remember if I can say, wow, is that, yeah. really, is that really the consequence out of that? Instead of uh, investing into a rollback functionality, anyhow, I, I was like, wow. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's fascinating, right? Yeah. It's, it's completely against the continuous delivery philosophy, yes. right? Yes. In, in, in the, the famous continuous delivery book, yes. where like, you really want to release often because then you practice it. You, you make the releases like boring. You make them like so exactly. like, easy and transparent, exactly. right? And this enables engineering teams to focus on the product yes. rather yes. than like, uh, you know, fixing the releases, yes. like managing rollbacks and cherry picking what, what, what is yes. the good change to include in the release or not. But the key thing why I think this is so important, right? Everyone wants to do it like this, but I would say 99% of the enterprises in the world, they're not there, right? Releasing means a day of work, right? Or maybe then every two weeks. And that's already kind of, you know, requires extreme determination that they're able to do this, right? So, so in that respect, it is... Uh, for you, because you're doing this so many years, it's now, of course, that's the way we're doing it, right? And we want to do it. But hardly any organization, of, that's, I would say, with starting a couple of hundred engineers or more, are there yet. Yeah. Right? So, so that, that's still, that's still the us, reality in the industry. For us, it's, um, it's a constant challenge. It's not like, a, oh, we build it and this automation yes. works. And for the next yes. couple of years, we're good. Yes. Yes. Develop your change and yes. you'll catch the next release train and it goes out now. That this is, requires constant focus. We have the yes. developer productivity teams, yes. developer infra teams, and there are new challenges that arise, yes. new problems, and we have to be solving yeah. them. And I think that is for me, if you would have told another enterprise, hey, we want to build up a foundation team, we have 300 people, right, and we have 2,000 engineers, they would say, what? 10% of the engineering workforce is helping with the manufacturing process of software. They would have been probably upset by the idea that, that they have to invest so much resources into that. But they are now stuck with three months release cycles and you release a couple of days. And if you would compete with them, if you were in the same vertical, good night, right? For them, that's the reality, right? So, yeah, it's a good point. It's for in some organizations, it's hard to justify like those teams, the productivity teams, or the like build infrastructure, developer infrastructure teams. Like we at LinkedIn, we learned the hard way. So we used to be in the position where like releasing was hard. It took us, like, you know, we released every month and then we shrunk it to like every two weeks. But it was like a major hustle, and every release was stressful, and every release introduced a lot of overhead because like top engineers on the team would not be working on products, but they would be working on the stabilization phase of the release, right? So we learned the hard way. And then we yes. found that we can't be shipping to production as fast as we can. So we, we discovered that we need really strong foundation. We, yes. we, we need really yeah. strong like infrastructure. And this is also happening. I can see that like 
more organizations yes. are interested in it. Yes. There are like meetups for developer yes. productivity, yes. like amazing talks yeah. from all over the place. Yes. So yes. it's it's changing and it's, it's a, awesome. Yeah. I, I agree. You can I think we see now the realization that this needs to be that this is a first class problem, right? At CTO yeah. level, right? At many organizations. Even let's say organizations that are not so engineering driven culturally like, like LinkedIn. And that's that's great. And I think another part of that is right is it, yeah, there, there are the economic aspects of that, right? Uh, competitive advantage in terms of shipping fast and reducing waiting time for engineers. That is a big part of the budget. Oh, yeah. uh, but then there's also the satisfaction you have as an engineer, right? When you can be productive, when you can roll out your changes very quickly. So I guess, what is your perspective on, let's say, engineering churn and developer productivity at an organization? Uh. <laughs> So I am. I have this automation bug, like a virus. I love like automation yeah. and shipping to production very often, and I'm. I think that it really helps engineers in general. Like where, like when I can ship to production, like safely and like frequently, and like I'm working on my change this morning and I'm ready, and somebody reviewed my code, and later during the same day it goes out. It liberates me. It like helps me deliver faster, like yes. provide faster yes. results. Yes. Like and then I'm gonna contrast that with let's say you have, you know, you release every week, which is not too bad. Yep. You know, once yep. a week, you know, not yep. too bad. But then, I, if I'm an engineer on that team and the release is on Wednesday and it's already Tuesday and I promise that my change will go yep. out, what I'm doing yes. on Tuesday? I'm really frantically coding. Like and then I'm. Yes. You know, with mm -hmm. the unit test, maybe I'll do it later because yes. I really want my change yes. to, to be yes. included in the release, yes. right? Yep. And we don't want those, like those wrong incentives, those this yes. sort of a, right. you know model yep. where where you you are stressed, you cannot operate in in, in the model that every day I focused on building the yep. product, high quality yes. product, and I'm coding yes. and I'm not worrying when is the next release because it's you know yep. around the corner. The, the release train is almost Proof. there. So as you said, right, this is. It's a never-ending investment you you have to make into developer productivity, mm -hmm. right? New languages, new frameworks. You're growing, right? So yeah. you know there's so many things you you that that introduce regressions, right? Or that introduce new challenges. So developers are never 100% happy, I guess, with the work of the developer productivity team. And and so for me, there's one one question I I like to ask developer productivity team. So if you made the build 20% faster. Would anyone say thank you? Or would anyone even notice? Right, you did it. I mean, it's an amazing 20%. Wow, how much money this saves and whatnot. But I think it, it's, it's not that much faster that everyone would realize, oh, it's so much faster, right? So, so how, do you, how, how are you trying to kind of communicate to the developers, hey, this is the great work we're doing, right? And this is the progress, even if you haven't realized it, right? That, that, that we have achieved. Most of the teams at LinkedIn, especially the big ones, the important ones, they care very like a lot about the build speed, like a lot. Like one of the key indicators that we are looking at when we assess the developer productivity is how long does it take, like from coming to production. But actually, we we partition that to like we the time that we track is like how much it takes, how, how long it takes from pushing a commit. Yep and getting the binary that is ready to be shipped to production, right? So like, and this like helps us a lot because this, this chunk of time, this part of the pipeline is absolutely managed by like tools. Yes. Like the quality of your tests, yes. the quality of your automation. So we have like direct like influence on this. We as a like build tools organization or like developer infra organization, because product developers, they write those tests, they implement the tests. Yes. And, uh, so you're working in a centralized tooling team, so you're not part of an application team, no, yeah. right? And, and I mean, we're providing a platform with Grail. And, and what we're always struggling with, if, if, if we have to support something, let's say an IDE, we're not using ourselves, right? Yeah. The empathy, right? Yeah. How do you get basically, how do you create empathy, right, within your team for problems you're not facing yourself? You know what I mean? It's hard to keep like the level of engagement like between like the application development teams and the developer productivity and infrastructure and like you manage that through process through like you know meeting regularly and working together work regularly sometimes embedding yeah. engineers from productivity teams within the application team so there, there are ways 
Thanks at the more. same time, we have to acknowledge this challenge because it is a challenge. Yes. Because, you know, you have different yep. goals, yes. right? Like, you know, yes. and yes. then that's, that's absolutely fine. That's actually healthy because if you have like those like different goals, then the, when they all, they, when they merge, we have the, we have a great like development, like ecosystem. Like one thing I want to call out is that like the application team, the product team, they want to like go as fast as possible, right? Developers on the like German autobahns, uh, you know, highways, <laughs> just shipping yeah. like uh, features yeah. and like developing, right? Now, like the developer infra team, like we don't want to go that fast, you know, like we are building foundation and infrastructure, yes. right? We have to yes. be really cautious because yes. like, like yes. our mistakes, the problem we introduce, yeah. they'll have like very like large yes. scale impact. Yes. So like there, there are differences, like yeah. have slightly different goals, right yeah. you know but yeah. like overall like this helps us yeah. and we need to manage that like that challenge and and we do and like you will do too like if you if yeah. you have build those teams yeah. Um, yeah that's cool so i like the embedding uh, uh, idea because that that's what i've what i've seen a lot in the wild at least traditional build engineering team i've seen the teams that they only have their own agenda right we just want to have stable a stable release pipeline we don't care if any new features are in there. Just has to be stable, right? And they were, they were not caring about hey, what are the developer needs? They they, they ignored the complexity of mm. the challenge. When I'm doing consulting, when I was doing Open Week, I always want to talk directly with the developers, not just with the build <laughs> team, because I think ah, they, they, they and they don't necessarily like that. They want to be the kind of you know team that that gives me the information. But I I and then I learn a lot of interesting stuff, right? And in the healthy yeah. organizations, yeah. there's cooperation. Right, and in the unhealthy ones, you have a lot of friction, and there's this yeah. almost like uh, the enemies, right? It's it's uh, it's that, we that has do, to change. We also have friction, like it's oh, not not course. it's not a rose garden yep. all the time. Yep. Not yep. not all our tools are up to the quality that we want them yep. to be. Yep. Yeah, so it's a it is a challenge. But the, the key is right that there is a functional relationship, right, and not it like this be, uh, has to be. One yeah. of the problems that we like found at LinkedIn is that like foundation team or like sometimes referred as like tools team at LinkedIn, we like traditionally were the guys that deal with the tools. Mm -hmm. Like we, we, we build products and like, and then you can throw the ball over the fence. Like those guys will like do the tools where like, that's not really like healthy. Uh, we, yes. the, we need yes. to re we need to work together. Yes. We want to really understand what like tooling needs you have. What are your use cases? Yes. What are the yes. problems at the same time? We don't work on all the tool need, tooling needs for entire LinkedIn. We have to focus on the core developer infrastructure, on the challenges that are sufficiently generic, that apply yes. to every, yes. every software team yep. at LinkedIn. Not like, oh, this, this, this one team, they have this one problem, yep. oh, but this is tools, we are not going to deal with this, we're going to yes. just tell those guys to fix it. Like, that's not going to work. Yes. Right? It really needs to be... Sometimes we, we, many of the automations and tools, we have joint ownership, like software-wise, where we would be like jointly working together on ah, some of the that's, pieces. So that, that also cool. Mm, cool. is that's a pattern good. that we use. That's, that's great. That's great because it's the same for us, right? We, we, do, we don't have the domain expertise for every ecosystem out there, Absolutely. Right? Uh, Absolutely. And we want to provide, yeah. like for the dev infra team, uh, or like Gradle Foundation team, we have a Gradle Foundation team at LinkedIn. We want to provide this Gradle expertise and consulting, but it does not that mean that that team will own all the Gradle yeah. plugins across yeah. LinkedIn because we have 500 Gradle plugins at LinkedIn developed for all kinds of technology stacks and challenges and use cases. And the team only owns the core like yeah. Gradle platform. Yes. Right? We can't really own yes. every, every plugin. You, it just right. wouldn't scale at all. Yeah. Right? Cool. I mean, no, it makes com that makes complete sense. But you're still but you're still the experts, right? You can give them and advice. I think that's a to. that's a really good system. And Absolutely. so one question uh, I have is in terms of uh, recruiting for a build engineering team, right? What are the, the qualities you're looking for? Like 20 years experience with make maven and gradle or it's useful of course like having yeah. like you know many years of experience in the domain of automation that's useful i'd say that the key key attribute we look at is being able to like unstuck yourself when you're working on problems because what we found is like developer productivity devs or like dev uh, the build tools guys they they work with like hundreds of code bases across different teams and uh, like even te different technology stacks. Mm -hmm. You don't have traditional team on one product. Like you have a 10, 10 devs working on the same yes. product. So like, if you don't know anything, you just, hey, 
how do I do this? And yes. he tells you. Yes. And that the, you, you sometimes work on, on like many problems and you don't really have like a you know, bunch of other people you, who you can ask how to solve particular problems. So you have to be really able to figure things out yourself. And that's like, that's the key attribute we look at. And that's, I found it like really hard to even, uh, you mm -hmm. know, learn on the, on the job. This yes. is really something pretty yes. like inherent. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, one other thing I want to call out, which is, I think something that we found, we were successful in like teaching is this empathy like that. You really want mm -hmm. to understand the problem, understand the use case before you start like developing. So it's, yes. it cannot be this gang ho. Yeah. Oh, uh, somebody comes with the feature yeah. request. Yeah, sure, why not? It sounds like a good idea. Yes. And you, you, you just yes. go, understanding, okay, do you yes. really need that feature? Why? Yes. Okay, why don't you yeah. use that? Like, yes. okay, how does it feed our like strategy yes. of like building yes. tools for engineers? Yes. And then like, oh, okay, now it makes sense. Okay, let's start yeah. building something, right? Yes. You look for people that, that can really have product ownership, that have a product mindset saying, hey, wh why do you yeah. need that? Not just, oh, yeah, I do it, right? Yeah. And, and, and that requires also a little bit maturity or some maturity on the developer side that they not just say, oh, we want that feature, right? But that they are willing to kind of yeah. discuss the problem space and yes. are also not arrogant on their side saying, just do Absolutely. it and shut up, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. to me, the... Like all developers at LinkedIn are like our customers, yeah. right? And we, I absolutely yeah. want to make sure we solve their like problems yeah. and the use cases. This does not mean that we'll do everything what customers want us to yeah. do. Hey, build this thing for me. Like yeah. we really want to understand the why, well, why you need yeah. this, right? And yeah. this, is, this, is, this is interesting and this is challenging for the developer productivity teams because those teams often don't have like traditional product managers as would yes. the typical product yes. you have. Typical yes. product team has a product manager who like has the vision for the product, right? And he can like help the team design that product. On the developer infra, well, you know, those are engineers, they build yes. tools for engineers, yes. so they should be good yes. being like product yes. managers, right? But that's not the case. Like yes. this product thinking has to, like yes. somebody like, People it's have essential. to take that lead. Some engineers yes. would have to be able to take that hat and do it. And, and two things I see out there in the wild, right? One is uh, there's not this product thinking and basically it's always, it, 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 it's everything is based on escalation, right? Developers are upset about something, that is the next priority, right? They don't have their own kind of roadmap, right? That's and cool. their own criteria to say, hey, this is what we think is good for the customers, right? That's I true. mean, the customers don't always know, they're not, they're not necessarily deep experts in all the yeah. automation questions, right? So you have to have your own opinion on yeah. what you think is good for them. So that is one thing we're seeing, right? They're just driven by escalation and you think, hey, but you have this obvious problem. Like, oh, but no one is complaining about it. So, okay, is that really how you want to drive your priorities, right? That, that's kind of, a, for me, thinking about process engineers in other industries, right? Those are real experts. They have studied that topic, right? And they have their very own agenda, their very own opinion, what makes a productive environment, right? And I think we Absolutely. need to have people with that, that have product vision, yeah. right? Otherwise you're yeah. just driven yeah, like, a, like a leaf in the wind. Yeah. And then the other thing we're seeing that, that prevents that from happening is that they that the build teams get completely swamped by support requests. My CI build is not oh, working. Yeah. And you want to have product people in a team and then all they have to do is to uh, fix a, a build failure, right? Which is not even related to the build logic, but to a change in the code base. No, absolutely. I, what you say, that we see that at LinkedIn. I love the quote from Henry Ford. It's like, if I did what like, my customers wanted me to do, I would give them faster horses. Right? right, so you <laughs> yes. you want to listen yes. to the customers, yes. but you really want to like like design uh, that product yourself. Yes. Like, yes. And what you said earlier reminds me about the squeaky wheel problem that you, you will fix the squeaky wheel, and that squeaky wheel is the team that is screaming the most that hey, you know, yes. our build fails yes. and stuff. Yes, uh, and or you know we have this big problem, and you know they will be prioritized because they are the loudest, yeah. which. Uh, to some degree with that problem helps having like separate organization yes where you know a different organization yes. has you know the budget and resources yeah. to decide what we work on yeah right right and then right. like the and mm. the escalations have to be resolved and the mm. prioritization mm. has to be like um, yeah. agreed on yes I like great that that's that's great insight when you when you look at the engineering leadership at LinkedIn what uh, you already talked about the metric uh, 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 commit to uh, production, right? 
Is, are there any other metrics oh. they're interested in, where, where you basically where they hold you accountable for improving it or for at least not Absolutely. seeing any regressions? Yes. So our leadership like looks at various metrics related to developer productivity, because at the end of the day, like we want to have an organization where like developers are like like can really focus on building great products and are productive. So. What we look at, like from like commit volume to like various code review metrics, like all changes that LinkedIn has to have to go through code review. So we look like how long does it take from like when the review is created and when the review is like approved for shipping to production. We look at uh, how long do deployments take. Like is it like a, you know half hour to deploy your entire application to all the hosts or or, or, yep. or slower. Yep. So we look at various kinds of metrics and. The one that we particularly look at from the standpoint of foundation, like my team, is commit to like production ready. So you, yes. you ship your change, and when do you have the binary that you can ship to production? And that's like that's that's one of the key metrics as well. We also look at the local dev metrics, like uh, the hot reload, for example, or like yeah. the, like like the development cycles to make nice. them as fast as possible. Yes. And we want them cool. to be also like fast. You want cool. like developers to be productive. Cool. Over the next, let's say, over the next three to five years, what are features that you think, oh, they, they, those are the most missing features. They, they would have the biggest impact to improve from where we are right now in, in, the, in, the, in the automation field. What, 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 what would some of those features be? Either you're looking forward that someone else pr provides them or you, you, you might want to develop yourself at LinkedIn. Oh, at LinkedIn. Let's zoom out and, and think mm -hmm. about like the, like the global landscape. Yep. I'd love to see more tools and automation and solutions for both for the multi code base environment and for the like mono repo yep. use cases yep. and the multi code base environment like i mentioned that before i would like a solution like a yep. really complete holistic end to end solution for like hey i have this you know 1000 uh, developers organization we have many many code bases but we want to organize around that so we yes. want to have a like code review, code review systems, we want to have trunk-based development, we want to be able to understand the, what versions are in production, what are the version conflicts, how do I resolve them, the dependency graph, like all that. I, I would love to see a solution mm. for that and I don't mm. think anyone is actually developing it. Like You have a bunch of tools that you can yep. integrate and you can yep. do, uh, you can build yourself, we, we built it yep. at LinkedIn. But there's no like a really like a, there's no solution for that, and I would love to have that because ideally at, at LinkedIn I want to focus. I at LinkedIn I would prefer not to be building the core developer infra. Yes. I would like to build yeah. the stuff that is really unique to LinkedIn, yeah. or you, like solving our unique challenges, uh, rather than you know how do we do you know code reviews, how do we yeah. do uh, that yeah. kind of stuff. I I don't want to. I, I would like to have use a top, off the shelf solution that mm -hmm. is proven to work in other organizations yeah. as well. Yeah. That would be my yep. preference. And like one last thing is like I'd love to see also progress on like the monorepo tooling. Like you know Facebook, Google are investing yep. in in uh, in back and base yep. and like build systems. Facebook is investing in Mercurial, yep. the um, source source control. Microsoft is investing in the virtual file system for Git. So I'd love to see more there. I don't mm. think those tools mm. are there yet. I don't think if mm. I have really really massive development teams, I can just take those tools and yes. like, get it yep. uh, working. I think it, I would still need a lot of like investment. Yep. Um, but at some point in the future, in a couple of years, I think there will those tools will be there. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah, and for us, it's it's the same, right? It's it's uh, it's different dimension of scalability, right? You need to scale for very large repositories, and you need to be able to scale for many repositories. That is what a modern build infrastructure needs to provide, right? It needs to, uh, and if you look at where the industry is, they're kind of in a <laughs> in a difficult state. So they have their monorepo, which is mostly a monolith in most cases, right? And they are they 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 got really burned by that. Now they're trying to get away from it, right? And shipping away and creating many, many small repositories. But the majority of the code is still in the monolith. So now they have a, they still have this big monolith thing. And, but now on top, they have now the orchestration of thousand code bases to deal with. So they, 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 they're in the worst of, in terms of complexity, uh, possible state. And that is, that is, I would say, where many, many organizations are right now. And it will not change. They will not be able to, 
to get rid of the monolith for yeah. for quite a few years, right? And you have to so account for like cleaning the tech debt. You really have yes. to like fund it. Okay, I want to have a team that cleans up the tech debt. Yes. And I want to share some number. Yeah, please. Last July, we completely removed our old mono repo that traditionally we yep. had at LinkedIn. Yep. Like the effort of like getting rid of it took like 2.5 years for us, for a couple of uh, devs. And like we, when we started the repo was at, uh, I think it was 12 million lines of code. And, at, and when we finished it, created 800 like separate code bases. Wow. Um, yeah. Like probably yeah. half of it or like 30% we deleted. Like that was yes. like the dead code. Nice. So it's just like interesting, so interesting, right. interesting like a, a also, data point. I think we're ready for uh, uh, some questions. So yeah, what kind of, of changes did your team make to help take LinkedIn from releasing once a month to multiple times daily? And how long did that take? There were, it's hard to, uh, there were like many changes and also it was a gradual process. So first we started to like, how can we shrink that process from one month to two weeks into one week? At some point we were fairly, fairly productive with uh, weekly releases, but still we wanted releases several times a day. And that was, that was a decision we made and we really, it forces us to organize and like build necessary tooling. And it's not only tooling, like build processes, like teach engineers how to write high quality tests that give high quality signal in a short time. So what are the changes? I think they were like both in like automation side. There was an automation side of thing and there was like a process side of thing. Process would be to shift from this thinking that, oh, you know, we can manually test something a little bit later, right? I can, I can ship that change today and tomorrow I will verify that. Like you mm -hmm. couldn't have that at all. Like you really have to, every day you have to produce highest possible quality of the code because this goes to production today. So it's like a, like a major mental shift for like, like engineering teams where there's no, there's no phase of stabilization of the release where you cherry pick, you know, you know, like code changes that work or like bug fixes and stuff like that. It's really like every day you focus on quality. And this also push it, puts a lot of pressure on like how to develop your test, how to structure your test. You have to be thinking about your testing pyramid, right? Like those slow UI tests, mm -hmm. You don't want to have too many of those. You want to have a lot of like unit tests. Like how do you mm. create, how do you manage flaky tests? That was like a big for us. Mm. Uh, how, do we, how do we ensure that one of the biggest challenges was how do we ensure that the, our trunk, our master branch is always healthy? Like we really cannot have, you know, broken master branch and then just, oh, somebody's fixing it and the next half hour he'll be done and he'll fix it. Like you can't have it. Like if you have a large team and you want to ship to production several times a day, you have to front load all your testing before the code is merged so that like you have the highest chance that uh, your trunk, your master branch is always healthy at any point of time. So th those are some of the challenges. And I, this is like a lot. So I hope that it answers your question at least to some degree. And uh, did that new model, I'm just curious, couldn't, were there engineers that couldn't deal with that new world and rather preferred uh, a world with kind of uh, longer cycles and stabilization phase? I, I'm just, I mean, I, I would love, to, for me it was always ship, oh, ship, so ship, right? But it's, yeah. uh, it, was it a cultural a change uh, uh, that, that affected how you recruit people? That, that you were looking oh. because of that potentially for different proof for different engineering profiles in terms of what engineers to recruit we it's, it's a great question for for the teams that ship to production very frequently like our linkedin.com there was no like major pushback like like engineers they like to ship their changes to production yeah. like frequently this is yes. like this is part of my productivity yes. so they are happy like this puts a lot of pressure on like writing a lot of tests and you know dealing like yes. making sure like every engineer from time to time is in the on call rotation where he helps yes. with releasing so yeah. there are certain chores there is certain like overhead for an engineer he's not only like, he he cannot be only responsible for like happy and merry coding yes. like of a, you know yes. code features and somebody yes. else deals with the releases yes. with stabilization yes. so yes. not everything is like yep. you know uh no, sad work yeah sad work uh, so every engineer cool. has to be kind of a DevOps guy. So yeah. I don't see the problem there. Now, cool. if we look at the entire LinkedIn, we have teams that like, cannot ship to production 
like you know a few times a day like yeah. we have teams that work on our like data storage yeah. which is like we, which has to have like great performance and yes. you can't have this you cannot run this performance test in a few hours you need yeah. to have soak yeah. tested for yeah. for a couple of days yeah. so like it really depends yeah. what what kind of domain we're talking yeah. about Yep. But and some teams wouldn't be able to, and that, and it's undesired for yes. them. It's it's fine if they uh, if they have different release cadence. Yep. Cool. Well, tons of great questions. So uh, Mary is asking, uh, when solving a developer or infrastructure tooling limitation, how do you determine whether to build a solution in house opposed oh to God. buying a product off the shelf? <laughs> this is an amazing question. Like this is this whole build versus buy dilemma, mm. and. It's all about ROI. So you have to build some kind of a cost uh, return of investment model. Like what is what are the costs? Yeah. What are the benefits? Yeah. And what the cool the, the useful indicator is like what is your core, uh, what is your core business as an organization? Does it make sense for you to maintain something? Yeah. And then the trade off is okay. You can accept the off the shelf solution, but then you have to accept the trade offs. Like you will have some like it's not maybe some of the things will not work perfectly for you. Maybe some of the use cases is something, ah, you know, I don't like this feature, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, I don't like how it works, but on the other hand, like, we, we don't want to build it ourselves yes. because that's, like, and then it's, in the built infra, it's, it's an often trap, maybe in product teams as well, where you think that, oh, we build it and it works, right? You build it once and you don't have to pay, you know, yes. and it's fine, this is like one cost, uh, it's, it's never one cost. Yes. Every line of code that you yes. write has yes. to be maintained yes. like, until Absolutely. this code is in production. Absolutely. So whatever you build, another mm -hmm. 100 lines of code, yes. another function, another class, it adds up yes. to your maintenance yep. long yes. term. Right? Yes. And like if you yep. keep building those customizations, custom tools mm -hmm. and custom features, then you, you find yourself at some point that, well, I have to hire a bunch of new devs because otherwise I cannot yes. build any new features yes. because I have yes. to like keep yep. maintaining the old stuff, yep. right? So yep. that's also like our like mm. build versus buy. It, it, it's a mm. big question. Yep. Like build the good ROI, return of investment yep. analysis. Good analysis. And like data driven, the, right, have data, good insights. The data will tell you. Because that's for me another fascinating thing. You come to organization, you ask them, how many builds do you have a day? How often are they failing? How long does a developer build take? How long does a CI build take? People, they, oh, yeah. no one knows. Oh, yeah. right? No one knows those. Oh, yeah. You think, okay, then how do you want to build an ROI model, right? When you don't know how often is it executed yeah. by the developer and things like that. So it's, uh, that's for I, me. I, I missed that metric when we talked about metrics. Yes. We absolutely also track the, the stability of our pipelines. Like the, right. Yeah, very how important. many uh, tool, yeah. tools failures we have, how many like user failures, like we, we also try And that. people, when you ask them, they completely underestimate, for example, the amount of failures. When you ask them, how many, how many of your CI builds are failing, right? So a couple of percent. And then, uh, and then you measure, oops, 25%, right? And it's not necessarily a good thing, a bad thing, right? But it's just that it, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, yeah, it, it's hard to do to make those educated decisions without data. And um, next question, how does LinkedIn support the build pipeline for different platforms, web, iOS, Android? Oh, f fantastic question. We started using Gradle build system back in 2011. At the time, Gradle was like pre 1.0, like very, yeah. like we were very early adopters. And for different technology stacks, we use dedicated different build systems. At some point, we found, we found it really useful to build like common build infrastructure on top of Gradle. So today we use Gradle for automating all our like technology stacks, including those that are traditionally not associated with mm -hmm. Gradle, like iOS, for example, like uh, the JavaScript pipelines. Of course, with those uh, technology stacks, we delegate to native tools yeah. a lot, yeah. right? So Gradle becomes pretty lightweight, uh, like thin layer mm -hmm. on, on top of that. So this is like our solution, and I, you know, we we, we learned on the way. We found that. With JavaScript, for example, we did uh, we put too much complexity into our like like you know the Gradle layer where we should have been pushing that down to like the native yep. tools, yep. right? To yep. know, npm, yarn, the node mm -hmm. modules, and all that. So like this is not every time we made like the best decision. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we found that like we used SBT for our play framework. We have two hundred play application. This is like our like major part of our infrastructure of our web apps. And we replaced SBT, so traditional build system that comes with Play Framework, with Gradle. And that was like a big project. 
and it like helped with developer productivity across the board, like faster builds, faster hot reload. That was amazing. And uh, when we finished that SBT to Gradle project, we effectively moved all our like build infrastructure to Gradle. So like every project at LinkedIn, regardless of technology stack from like C++, Python, some, some other um, things, they are all built with Gradle. Mm -hmm. This allowed us to like scale our, like previously it did not scale for us because we had, you know, build tools engineers specializing in different build tools, like all over the place. So like the level of like silo within the team was high. And then there was like, we would have to, certain code has to be duplicated across of the technology stacks because the build systems yeah. were different yes. and you couldn't really reuse yes. that code. Yes. So can, having yeah. like common yeah. build infrastructure on top of like one technology, we chose Gradle. Yes. We found it useful for scaling. We yes. found it useful to help our team to yeah. scale. How do you get buy-in from developers used to doing long-lived branches to trunk-based development? And then what is a good way to help people change their mindset to move that way? This is hard. It's uh, at LinkedIn. We never, we never recommended like long-lived branches. So we didn't have the exact problem that you're referring to. We used to have like release branch, which you always have when you have, uh, when you have um, weekly releases or monthly releases. We used to have like development on branches as a, like a workaround for like let's deal with the integration problems later. I don't. I want to focus on my feature like kind of mentality. So we had some of that in the past, like going to trunk based development, like was something we have done a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Like the decision to yeah. do that was like circa 2011. Yeah. So that, that is like for us, it's like, like in the past, yeah. I'd say that the key, the key thing that we want to use to like convince developers to go to trunk based development is is the overhead of like integration, which is higher with the with the yes. with the long lived branches, yes. which is always higher. There's always yeah. there's going to be a chunk of development time dedicated to like integration, to cherry picking, to stabilizing, and that's just like that's like a pure yeah. waste. It's a nightmare. And for me, it, yeah. it was often for me when I've seen this was often a measure of desperation. You have a, a big monorepo, right? But it's uh, but the build is so slow. And the tests are flaky, so the only the only way you can make you could make some have some illusion. I almost want to say of progress if you have your own branch to have stability, right? But then the merge nightmare comes. So for me, it was it's almost like a, a desperate measure because you you know don't know what else to, absolutely to do, right? And not just wait all the all the time, right? And be broken and like the. Delivering incrementally in small batches is yes. key. It really helps. It's like you amortize the the complexity and cost over time, it, and that 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 is what trunk based development provides. But you can do it because you have fast feedback cycles, right? That is always that is the key, yeah. right? So and, 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 I want to say yeah. one, one one last thing is that trunk based development does not mean that you don't do branches at all. Oh no, actually, like it's yeah. just because yeah. some people say you have either yeah. trunk based development or like pull request model. Yeah. I found like people yeah. saying that that's just untrue. Yeah. No. You can absolutely do pull requests yeah. and do trunk based development. Yeah. You can even cook your pull request for a month if you need because like the change is like hard to do because you have to do a lot of like mm -hmm. figuring things out that 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 is that is fine so long this is not like a default way for the team to yes. operate. That like every developer works on like a month, one month uh, length uh, yeah. development branch, yes. and when there's like a you know last Friday of the month, let's do it, let's merge it, and who goes first is like easy for him, no yes. merge conflicts and stuff. Yes. So that you you don't want to end up there, but it's fine to yeah. like work with branches. Yeah. yeah. So, in your opinion, very interesting question. What kind of size does a team need to be before they really start paying attention to build automation, uh, DevOps? Con and DevOps concerns. Do you think this should be much of a concern for tiny teams, let's say 10 developers? It's from Shitesh, the question. This is an amazing question. I'm going to use one interesting data point. So when we started developing like a new LinkedIn.com in 2015, we found that when we had more than 15 engineers on a team, like delivering to the same code base, like the Git model, like Git stopped scaling mm -hmm. for us in the sense that developer couldn't push his change. Why? Because he has to merge with the upstream. So he merges with the upstream, he runs the build or like wait, like yes. sends the build request to run it in the cloud. 
half hour later the build is finished, it's all good, I want to push again. He tries to push, yeah. oh, I cannot push again, I need to update, and, I, and then developers were not able to push code, right? So uh, that also is one of the reasons is that we don't use pull request model, we, yes. use, we uh, at LinkedIn internally, yeah. we have like trying based development. So this is was our like trigger point for, oh, shoot, we need some kind of like a yeah. commit merge queue to like to get all the all the commits in, in the queue and start like merging them and running the build. This is like an example of, of a metric where we have found out that at certain point, like of the uh, team size, something stopped scaling for us and we have to come up with a solution. I, there's no, you know, and it really depends because yeah. you would be finding those different trigger points you know, for different problems, for deployment, for local development, yep. you'll find that, oh, the code base now is too big to, yep. uh, you know, to use it in IntelliJ or into yep. the IDE. We yep. have to do something, right? But, but at the same time, so my answer is simple. Okay. If this is a serious project, not just a four-week experiment, even if it's three people, even if it's myself, I would invest into automation. I would make automation a first-class citizen from the, from the very first day. Right, and it would be very different automation with very different scalability like requirements than you have at LinkedIn. But automation, if you don't do it, it will bite you. You will pay a price after 30 days. You, you are already less productive than compared to you had invest in automation on the first day, right? So I would say any project with a build, right? And then, and then as soon as I have something to do manually a couple of times, invest in automating it yeah. because it's a key part of lean production is make it easy to ask questions and for me when you don't have automation oh was there performance regression compared to yesterday or it takes me now two hours to set everything up to ask that question i don't ask the I like question I, I right so but of course it continual you, like thinking yeah. and like considering an uh, yeah. automation from from day one at the same time you don't want to like overcook you want to allow some evolutionary yeah. changes yeah. you want to like you want to be prepared for like scaling out you know you, you want to think okay what's going to happen next year when we double the size yeah. of engineering team at the same time you have to know that whatever you come up today to yeah. scale out next year most likely a year yeah. from now or two years from now you're going to have to scratch yes. it and like build yes. like you, you, because you'll have different scalability issues and you'll have to build like different things so i think manage your expectation and leadership mm -hmm. expectation that this is continual effort yes and like yes like that's key. collecting the data tracking the mm -hmm. data from day one mm -hmm. on like around productivity yes. like helps to solicit like resources yes. to that uh, yeah. to the effort of like automation and keep it simple but automate oh. right. I, I feel that we give very generic <laughs> answers <laughs> no for me it's like immediately right automation immediately right because yeah. i've seen it and it's so and that also gets your people in a, in, a product, in a productive mindset. I mean, when I asked you the question, right, what brought you into the domain? You said automation. I, when I joined a team, it was always the first thing I took on the responsibility. We need to increase the amount of automation. I cannot be productive without it, right? So, so for me, it's keep it simple. Don't, don't say, oh, uh, uh, for a small code base, we need to split it over 50 repositories because maybe in, in two years that helps you. Keep it simple. Uh, but but automate what you need to automate. And so next question from uh, Mashura. Uh, I assume you have end-to-end -to -end tests for everything before you do a release or at least some smoke tests. We have all kinds of tests. Yeah. The end-to-end -end tests or like UI tests, they're expensive. So we, we manage our testing strategy well so that yeah. we can, like in order to release several times a day, you have your tests have to fit certain like time box, right? Yes. You cannot your test yes. center cannot run for yes. six hours yes. because it's just yes. not going to work. So this is a like this is for us a forcing function yeah. to get our testing cool. strategy well, uh, yes. and also to think about like what is the stuff you you don't want to test? What is the yes. stuff that you uh, like? This is not worth like building yeah. tests for. We have. We monitor our production rollouts like we can, you know, we can hide the feature if it's problematic. Mm -hmm. So you, you introduce different ways of managing your risk, not only like tests. Right. That's, right? that's a very good point. So, yeah. yeah, nice. Second last question. With such a rapid production release schedule, how often do changes need to be reverted? Maybe never. How time consuming would reverting production changes typically take? That's from Tony. It depends on the product. Very rarely it's going to be a rollback or revert for us with a high volume of like, usually forward fix. 
it's, mm. it's just more natural yeah. way of doing things. Keep in mind that we don't expose the feature yet. We have ways of like exposing that we can hide it. If the feature is problematic, we can like hide it like automatically. So you don't have to revert the code from the production system. So mm, I hope this answers your question. Like we do have, ro there is a way to roll back. There is a way to like in trunk based development at LinkedIn, there's a way to create a hot fix uh, like change on, on a version that you built, like say yesterday or like two days ago. So we have like tooling around that. We have yeah. processes around that. It's it's possible. It is it is pretty rare. Yeah. Usually you forward fix, mm. and it happens relatively like for let's say for the for the API service behind LinkedIn.com, mm -hmm. like some kind of some kind of like rollback um, happens. A couple of times a week, so so this happens, and I, I I think it's 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 a bit too high. We should we should put it put it down. At the same time, yeah, I, I guess that's. I hope that answered the question. Cool. Last question. <laughs> that's, how do you handle flaky tests? <laughs> <laughs> flaky tests are all yeah. fun. So one of the things we have discovered is that flaky tests are like one of the most disheartening like morale and energy sapping problem like in an engineering team where you know you, you want to ship your change and yet like the test that is written by somebody else is failing and it's flaky you can't get your change out it's 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 very problematic and at the, and also what we have discovered is that it really hurts our like frequent release cadence if you have flaky tests because your build stops and then you have to rerun things so some of the things to, to that we have discovered to manage them like like tracking and managing flaky tests. So understanding what are your flaky tests, you want to track it. On some of our code bases, we have automated tools to disable flaky tests. So they would run all the tests overnight without any changes. So if you mm -hmm. run a test 1000 times without any code change, you'll find out if it's flaky or mm -hmm. not. So that's that's uh, one way to do it. Uh, what else we do? That's cool. Mm, we, you will have to you have to manage flaky tests like in a small team that doesn't release to production frequently it's fine to have a flaky test probably the cost is like really low for larger teams a lot of the com high commit volume uh, you want to do it like some organization we don't do it that often but some some organizations deal with flakiness with various kinds of retries oh, yeah. if you uh, yeah. invest in retries like this it's like a slippery slope Yes. Right, like so, yes. you have to be yes. watchful. It's when you are doing retries, retry from the point of failure rather than like retrying the entire like big operation because you want to optimize for for speed. And uh, yeah, track like keep tracking that. Keep another like you want to make the flaky test visible and also like attributable to teams or to even individuals. Mm. Like so, you have this concept of like a. Like visibility respons leads to responsibility, leads to results, right? So we make it visible, the, the flaky tests, like, you know, how many flaky tests? And then, oh, wow, we have 5% flaky tests. Yes. And like those in yeah. introduced by those teams or by the, like the, those are the owners of those tests. Like, why don't we keep them, account keep them accountable for fixing them? Cool. Awesome. So, yeah, thanks for the great questions. Thanks for the fantastic answers. Sure. I learned a lot, right? So uh, Thank you. thanks for coming. Uh, that, was, that was great. And uh, yeah, so uh, continue the discussion and feedback at Twitter. Mokido Guy is uh, Stepan's uh, Twitter handle. My one is Hans D. Uh, for more on Gradle, see gradle.org and gradle.com. But particularly uh, on gradle.com, we, uh, we have a couple of uh, a blog post that that also discussed this topic about you know challenge of build, build engineering uh, the cost of build building our i models around build so uh, you find some good resources there on gradle.com and then uh, yeah our next webcast uh, will be around build performance troubleshooting uh, sometimes in june we will uh, we will let you know once once the uh, the date is established thanks a lot for attending uh, have a great day. Have a great evening. Yeah. Bye. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you learned a lot and like keep automating. Keep automating. <laughs> I can't stress it more. <laughs> cool. Thanks a lot. Hi.